I think the mission of any business should be to create raving fans. Like your customers are your best salespeople. Yeah. Right. They should be, they should be spreading the word. If you want to be a freaking billionaire, go hang out with billionaires and see how they think and say, hey, well, how do they see this differently than me? And can I just adopt their belief system? Because clearly I'm not thinking about this with the right mental model. Okay, welcome back to the Tech Jobber podcast. I have an amazing treat for you guys today because we are diving into the recruiting world uh, with an absolute force in my space. Uh, I've been waiting to meet this guy for a while and now I get to sit down with him and, uh, and ask him questions for an hour. So uh, Chris Vasquez, he is the owner, CEO, founder of Quantum. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man, I'm pumped. And for anyone that uh, doesn't know you, why don't you just give a quick overview of uh, your credentials? Yeah, so founded a company called Quantum, what is that, four and a half years ago. So I've been in the recruiting field for 11 years or so now. Mm -hmm. Went to three companies or so, figured I could do it better and had a bigger vision for it. And uh, launched the company four and a half years ago, focused primarily in the venture capital startup space. You know, I was, I was working in big Fortune 500 staffing companies and sure. you can do really well there, but like, I think the main thing you gotta do is find a customer that you're obsessed with serving. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I just wasn't passionate about the Fortune 500 anymore. I didn't like the big bureaucratic companies. So I decided to go all in on startups, launch Quantum, and we created a new model. Mm -hmm. There's staffing companies that focus on kind of team build outs and individual contributor roles. And then there's executive search companies that build executive teams for yeah. companies as well. So we merge them into one. It's called a compound startup, right? You're building multiple startups in one. But our ethos was let's build one company where we can single-handedly take startups from seed all the way through IPO. Yeah. And I just I dreamed of adding so much value to founders that I could be standing next to them in New York, in Times Square, sure. when they're IPOing. And so that was the vision that drove me. And the model came from that is like, what would we have to do to create so much asymmetric value that we're an indispensable part of company success? Mm -hmm. So we combined executive recruiting and scale ups, we call it, to build companies. And we do that across AI startups, Web3, crypto, SaaS, FinTech, healthcare, um, really the whole venture ecosystem. And so that's what we're on a mission now to do is to become the preeminent firm for all venture capital backed startups. Gotcha. Okay. So I, I was, uh, I feel like I could write your autobiography. I was, uh, watching interviews all weekend. Um, also looking up your LinkedIn, you started off with, um, one of my old competitors inside global, uh -huh. um, just doing staff aug, uh, did you kind of dabble in the executive search there? No, the end? funny thing is, man, I never had done any executive search prior to Quantum. So at Insight okay. Global, for people that don't know, it's just one of the big staffing companies, yep. you accidentally land there. And I don't think yep. anyone intentionally gets into recruiting, but nope. I think it's the most Absolutely. lucrative, fun, meaningful career that's like the least known. Cause you're like, yeah. if you look at every company that's built, it's built from exceptional talent. And where does that talent come from? It comes from recruiters and they can be internally at a company or they can be at an agency. In my experience, there's some exceptions, but most of the most talented recruiters in the world uh, are in agencies because that's why they're paid the big bucks. Sure. Um, but uh, at Inside Global, it was all staff augmentation. So sure. what that means is like there's big companies that have big projects and you gotta go recruit 20 engineers to help them with these projects. Used to do that for companies like Qualcomm and Intuit and big companies like that. Uh, then, you know, from there it was more boutique companies, but mm -hmm. still focused more on staff fog. Got into some direct hire, which basically just means you're directly placing people as full time employees at companies. Yeah. Um, and progressively just went to smaller companies. Okay. So, you know, kind of like a higher level at, at the smaller companies. Yeah. Okay. And, and that was that was based in San Diego, correct? That was in San Diego, yeah. Okay. I went to University of San Diego, had no clue what I wanted to do with my life. I was at a career fair, and uh, there was this beautiful blonde, so I went to go hit on her, and uh, she was a corporate recruiter for Insight for Global. Insight Global. Yeah. And I was like, I'll take as many interviews as you want to give me. And uh, you know, they, they have a reputation in the industry, so that, yeah, that kind of aligns, yeah, let's just so, say. <laughs> I mean, the recruiting tactics are extremely effective. It worked on me. Um, sure. But, uh, but yeah, it, it was a good time. But you kind of just fall into it, so it was, uh, yeah, that's how it was. Yeah, and it's like, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this. Like, 
a lot of people in uh, staffing are just like the most insufferable people you've ever dealt with. So everyone was like, oh, this is what, you know, I'd meet people in Miami, like, this is what you do. You, you got to meet Chris. You got to meet Chris. I'm like, let me see this guy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, I do have to meet this guy. Wow, okay. Because, like, recruiting is, for the most part, so uncool. Mm -hmm. And you've, yeah. met, you've helped make it cool, which I love. Dude, because I think a lot of that, when I first was doing recruiting for the first X amount of years, it wasn't cool. Like, yeah. the, the company cultures made it fun because the sure. cultures were... The, the culture itself at Insight Global and some of the other companies is fun, but if you're just placing like IT technicians and engineers on big projects, yeah, it doesn't have, it, it's not necessarily the coolest job, but I think how you relate to what you do has a dramatic impact on your level of success in that industry and you bring whatever you possess to that industry. And so for me, I got bored as hell of just placing people sure. inside of projects that would help companies achieve small outcomes relative to the size of the company. Mm -hmm. So for me, I said, okay, if I'm going to start a company, what would inspire me? Like, who would I be inspired to serve? Mm -hmm. I want to work with ambitious founders that want to change the world. I want to build the next Facebook, the next Uber, before anyone knows who that founder is yeah. and be in the trenches with them building. And I don't want to just place a few people at his company or her company. I want to build the entire company. I want to play a monumental role in their success from the earliest stages not only the engineers and the product people, but I want to place the biggest executives that are create the asymmetric growth. And that vision is what fired me up. And then mm -hmm. that for me is what made it cool to me because the startup space, that was intriguing. I'm like, I want to build the companies that are actually making a dent in the universe with really ambitious founders. And so I didn't have any experience with VCs, mm -hmm. which is venture capital firms. I didn't have experience with executive recruiting. When I started the company, I was literally doing mostly just basic level engineering work right, for, yeah, for, yeah. for, you know, for bigger companies. Mm. Um, so I went in with no experience in this particular domain, but I had base level, strong recruiting acumen mm. and I had a burning passion to figure out how to be the most valuable man in the world for these startup founders. Yeah. And that passion then drove me to learn the skill sets I needed to do to become more valuable, to create the business that could serve them in the way that we wanted to. Yeah. So, and, and so that was right at the beginning of COVID, like you started right before COVID and then COVID hit or. Yeah. I think we, st I started it in January and then COVID hit, I think right. by February or March, yeah. the whole market dried up, sure. right? No one was hiring. When COVID mm -hmm. hit, everyone went on freeze. Everyone's cutting costs. Probably the worst time in history to start a recruiting business other than like the great recession. Right. Um, but it was really, really, it was challenging. But what happened was it was the biggest blessing. So often you, you ask for growth, you ask for success, and the universe delivers it in a package you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And so I think when COVID hit, everything froze, but I was focused on San Diego businesses. I was this small mindset. That's all I knew my whole life was just San Diego businesses. Yeah. So I said, where's the money right now? There's capital flowing, but it's not here. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's Silicon Valley. I don't have any connections, any relationships. I don't have any startup connections. So I launched a podcast back then called The Founder's Playbook. And mm -hmm. I interviewed big investors and big entrepreneurs because they were willing to come on my podcast. Yeah. I, I learned a lot from those people. Mm -hmm. I got a feel for venture capital, for executive search. Um, and then I just worked my ass off, built a lead marketing system on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, cause I couldn't, I couldn't prospect 50 hours a week and recruit and do all this stuff. So right. I built a, an AI like automation sequence on LinkedIn, okay. which brought me our first few million dollars of clients. And, and, and how so did that work exactly? I just, yeah, I hired a coach to, to teach me copywriting, uh, persuasion and influence. Mm. And then I basically just had this program and I would write sequences. So it would connect, mm. send him a message, second message, third message. It's pretty popular now. And it's like way oversaturated. Yeah. But the, the key there is to have an authentic voice and be able to write really compelling copy. So it doesn't feel like you're selling to people. I would have people respond back like, man, this is such an authentic message. Thanks for the great outreach. And I'm like, that was my robot. <laughs> right. Wow. But that was what enabled me to land my, uh, some of my biggest clients mm -hmm. and really take us to the next level. And then I focused, okay, screw where I've been, screw what I know, where is the future? Where is the capital? Let me go there and figure out how to get there. And that's yeah. when I positioned to Silicon Valley, still building remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, but that also opened up remote talent because yeah. it wasn't common to do remote hiring whatsoever before COVID. Yeah. 
And you usually had to have boots on the ground to go bring in new accounts and bring in business. It was very in-person. So the idea that now I could meet a thousand people in year one, all remotely, and we yeah. could do business remotely, opened up the whole world as my potential client list. Yeah. And with that LinkedIn automation system and with enough work ethic and clawing my way in, um, we started to see a lot of success quick. Yeah, okay, and then at what point did you move to Miami? I moved to Miami two and a half years ago. Okay, yeah, it's right about when I got here. Um, so I have a lot of questions about quantum. Uh, so first question is, I mean, what is the main, what is the main driver now? Now, I guess you use the podcast, the LinkedIn automation initially. I know you have some connections with the VCs. Yes. Do they just say, okay, I'm a founder. I have some, some idea. Seems pretty good. Do the, does the VC say, great, here's the money, but you're using my guy to build out your company? So here's how it works. The venture capital firms, they might have a couple billion under management. Sure. A couple hundred million to tens of billions. They invest in hundreds of companies. And so if you can build a reputation with the VC, mm -hmm. with the general partners or the talent partners, um, they will refer you, their founders, when they invest in them. Mm -hmm. I think a big part when you're running any company, whether it's recruiting or not, you got to know your ideal customer. So for us, we found out they got to have at least $5 million in funding. If it's too early, they're pre-seed, uh, they're two guys with an idea. Yeah. It's generally not the good time for a recruiting company to come in because our fees are expensive. It's not worth it. Right. So companies that are venture-backed with $5 million, okay, great. How I did it, and you can apply this to any industry you're in. Because I think if you really want to build big companies, especially in B2B, this doesn't apply so much to consumer. You have to find big leverage points and channel partnerships. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. Yeah. And so I killed it for a couple founders that I got one-to-one. -one. I just directly reached out to the founders. And then I'm like, all right, well, who are the investors in this founder's company? Let me kill it for them, build undeniable proof that we're adding incredible value and have them rave about me to the VCs. Mm -hmm. But one founder can intro you to five venture capital firms. And so you go bottoms up, founder to venture capital firm, and then you can go top down, down, right? Because right? then yeah. they, can, they can introduce you to a, a litany of their startup founders. Mm -hmm. And they trust you. And we have the relationship with the portfolio companies, not with the venture capital firms. They don't pay us. They just connect us because they're incentivized to want to create enterprise value for their startups. So they want to refer great partners if they think those partners are going to deliver incredible value to increase the value of their companies. Right. And, um, you know, when we talk about this process, you know, I feel like everyone thinks oh, all you hear about is startup. This guy got equity and here's a couple million. Obviously, it doesn't always work like that. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time it doesn't. Right. So I want you to take through your process for evaluating uh, the startups. I mean, uh, there are people you say Dude, this founder. Yeah, it's a good idea, but I know this is not going to take off. Um, you know, so when you're looking at a startup and when job seekers, because they have obviously a fraction of the experience mm -hmm. looking at startups that you do, what are some key things that you would think of, of a checklist? Because they're at a Fortune 500 company, start, oh, it's great startup, equity, wow, this looks great. Mm -hmm. I mean, startups always sound great on paper, but what do you kind of see as red flags for people that they should look out for? So it's going to vary depending on the stage the startup's in, okay. right? If you're looking at a pre-seed startup, you have the highest risk tolerance. That's the highest likelihood it's not going to succeed. But you're going to get in with founding equity. It's going to be life-changing if it works out. But that's the highest risk tolerance. You have no product market fit, yeah. which basically means that customers have validated that there's a true need in the market for your particular product or service. And so that's the highest possible risk. Um, there are seed companies where you have a bit more traction. You probably have an MVP. You might have some users. You don't have product market fit yet. Mm -hmm. When you get to series A, a, a good amount of companies have a semblance of product market fit, which I think is about one, two million million in annual recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. But just because you have one or two million doesn't mean you have product market fit because if that's coming from two customers, it's not right. really a scalable product. If it's coming from a couple hundred customers, for me, that's a better signal. Um, and there's growth stage where you're, you know, making five, 10, 20 million ARR and you're just scaling. And there's a different person that's a good fit for each one of those. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when you're looking at startups, I think you have to know what your risk appetite is to know which stage you want to play at. 
if you're looking at early stage where I play a lot in early stage, mm -hmm. I like to get in at companies at seed or series A at the latest. And I do a lot of investing as well. I think with seed, you're always betting on the founder. Yeah. You can't over index on the idea. You can't over index on anything really, but the founder, um, because they might have to pivot three or four or five times to find the right idea. So you're like, you're betting on the horse. Okay. Right. Is this in, in, I think, what I look for in terms of the actual person is just raw intelligence. Sure. Are they wicked smart? Do they have a competitive edge in their field? Mm -hmm. Do they have some sort of deep knowledge, specialized knowledge and obsession with a particular field where they have, where they can see things other people can't see. Yeah. Right. And I think just relentless hunger and ambition, it can't be a side project. It can't be something that might work out. Like I got to know that they're all in like, this is life or death because if I have a guy with a, a chip on the shoulder mm -hmm. that has to prove something to himself or the world, I will bet on that person all day to figure shit out. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of intangibles you got to look at there. And they obviously have to have raw intelligence and understand their market and be self-aware. Um, but I think if you find people that are in directionally correct markets, not necessarily the perfect idea, but directionally correct markets, yeah. uh, like maybe it's vertical consumer AI, um, or you know, they're, they're revolutionizing healthcare or insurance or the legal industry with AI, and we know AI is going to disrupt. It's the correct direction where we know there's gonna be massive disruption. Yeah. The question is who's actually gonna pull it off? Right. Uh, and is that, is that person capable of that, in your opinion? So there's a lot of different factors you can assess founders on. When it gets later stage, I'm assessing more metrics. You know, like what's yeah. their growth rate? What's the retention rate? How's the product receive? Um, there's a lot more specific metrics you can see where the company's off to a particular trajectory. Mm -hmm. Also competitive differentiation is important. There's a lot of factors, but if you're doing early stage, bottom, bottom line is you gotta just bet on the right people. Mm -hmm. So if I were to simplify it, find someone who has a competitive advantage in their space and yeah. is the best in the world at their space, find someone who has a chip on their shoulder and has something to prove, has that fire in their belly, uh, find someone who has self-awareness and knows what they're great at so they can assemble the team to fill in their gaps and make sure it's in a directionally correct market so that even if it's not the most successful company because the tide is lifting all companies in that space, you're going to have some yeah. decent outcome. You're one of the first ones in that space. Yeah. Something. Okay. So, um, yeah, and if, if you've seen probably good ideas tanked by shitty founders, correct? And, and I, yeah, I, th I think that um, founder market fit is real. Like there can be a great founder, but it's the wrong idea or space for the founder, mm -hmm. right? Like there's plenty of businesses I can go start and I consider myself a good entrepreneur, but I would fail at them because I just don't have the competitive edge yeah. uh, or the passion. Because the reality is it's so fucking hard right. to build and scale companies. If you don't have a burning passion for that space and the customer you're serving, you're going to burn out eventually and you're going to lose the passion for your job and someone that feels like play, you know, it feels like work to you. It feels like play to somebody else. They're going to come and take your lunch. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one of the keys. Yeah. And as far, and so how do you operate? Do you get the client and then you go find the, the right fits? Yes. Are you constantly talking to kind of good potential kind of startup executives? I mean, you do executive all the way down, right? Yeah. Two different companies, quantum search, quantum scale, Functioning is one. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we're all, you're always building relationships, right? Mm -hmm. You're always just getting to know people, talking to the best talent, but primarily it's backwards from the client, right? So like, you know what types of clients you have, what roles you have. And if you're, if you're in a down, uh, a down time, yeah, you might have to proactively build relationships, but we're in a spot where we don't have a lot of time for proactive relationship building unless it's very high caliber talent because we have a lot of searches. So it's usually good to client figure out the roles yeah. and then go recruit the people for it. And then if you notice a pattern where we're bringing in a lot of these types of roles, okay, now it might make sense to proactively recruit more talent in that particular space because you know you're gonna have a lot more coming. Yeah, and in your opinion, what makes a good startup employee versus, okay, this guy might be great at a Fortune 500, but he couldn't handle this or just not a good fit. Look, if you wanna work in startups, it's completely different than big companies. Mm -hmm. If you want to work in startups and be successful, you need to be a voracious problem solver. You have to be a self starter. You have to be able to deal with incredible amounts of ambiguity and uncertainty. You have to have a high stress tolerance. You have to be able to pivot on a whim when needed. 
you have to have a missionary mindset. You're not a cog in a machine at a big company. Like you are a critical force in this company's success. Yeah. And you have to be able to roll up your sleeves and do whatever is necessary. Some people like to do what they like to do. In a startup, you have to do what's required, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to have a different mindset. You're no longer part of a big company working on a small project. You're covering a lot more scope, a lot more ground. You're dealing with a lot more ambiguous problems. Um, and that uncertainty is not something everyone can handle mm -hmm. or wants to do. Yeah. If you need a lot of structure, a lot of process, a lot of direction, early stage startups are not for you. Yeah. And so it's, it's self-assessing. It's like, hey, you gotta know yourself. Like, what am I really great at? What do I genuinely enjoy? And if that's a bigger company, you can make great money at a sure. fang company, you know, more than in a startup if you're, if you're not wired for it. So you gotta find what you're wired for, but mm -hmm. people in startups are willing to leave a lot of cash on the table for a future potential outcome. And they wanna be a part of something special. They wanna grind. If, if you wanna work 40 hours a week, please don't join a startup. You're gonna hate it. and you're not gonna be successful. Um, so startups just require more of you, yeah. uh, in my opinion. Now there's demanding roles inside of big companies, don't get me wrong, sure. there's really demanding roles, I'm sure, but by and large, the, the, the success of that company is not dependent on you so much. And so you can hide out a bit more, it's usually not as intense, and uh, you know, there's trade-offs to both. What do you see as, I mean, how do you guys kind of go about vetting that? You just kind of like scare them. Like it's gonna be a lot more work than you're currently doing. Um, yeah, we we typically don't recruit straight out of big companies. Okay. You know, if they were working on zero to one projects and they showed entrepreneurial tendencies at those companies, maybe, um, or if they're dead set, like, hey, I've been doing this for X amount of years. I'm bored out of my mind. Like, I want to work X amount of hours a week and grind my face off and build something meaningful. And I know that I want to do it in my soul. If they have that conviction, that I can buy that. But if like, yeah, I'm interviewing at Snapchat, Airbnb, and I'm considering startups, it's like, I can already tell mentally you're not the right fit. That ain't gonna work. Right. So it has to be a decisive thing. People know themselves, but like, what's your risk appetite? What's the right stage? And you kind of just go through some series of questions with them, but it's essentially that. It's like, how much risk are you willing to take? Mm -hmm. How much money are you willing to leave on the table for a future potential outcome? And how hard are you willing to work? Mm -hmm. You know, I think just knowing that and just knowing their particular psychological profile, you can figure out who's actually going to work out. And so, so you mainly go for people that have already been at startups or are currently at startups. That ideally, are, that ideally. Or yeah. Like I mean the perfect profile, not to generalize, but a lot of the best profiles are like they came from top schools. Not that that's the most important thing. A lot of our clients love that though. Sure. It's a good signal. Then they might've went to a growth stage company or a, a fang company and seen best in class at scale. Mm -hmm. And then they were like a Y Combinator founder, um, or they were an earlier founding member at a notable venture capital backed company. So they have what I call elasticity. Mm -hmm. They've seen greatness, they've seen scale, but they've also seen the earliest stages. So there's no surprises and they can elastically scale with a company. They can function at the most rudimentary foundational levels of the company where it's the most ambiguous and toughest. And as you guys grow and scale, they've also seen around the corner, it can help you you know, avoid those problems and, and make a contribution there as well. Mm -hmm. So those people tend to be really effective in startups, but I would index on startup over Fang all day yeah. for startups. Cause I think people say, Hey, I want to do this. This sounds interesting. They get in the ring, they get punched in the face and they run back to Facebook. Right. You know, so I think you need to know who you are, but you need a different level of grit and conviction sure. and work ethic if you're going to join startups. Yeah. And, and let's talk about your fees because, uh, obviously, it, it seems like it's a bit of a different structure depending on the company. ClickUp, obviously, you went. Did you go all equity? To I never do all equity, but I have okay. I have invested in a lot of companies, so I'll like defer equity. Okay. I'll defer cash for equity in a lot of the startups that I I believe in. Yeah. So are you paid yeah. per placement at the? I mean, I'm assuming these contracts are exclusive to just you guys. Correct. Most, most of the, the time, the executive time. side it's retained. So yeah, we just do 25 to 30% of the base salary okay. on the scale practice on the executive practice. We tend to fix that uh, on fixed fees, anywhere from 100 to 150 K typically mm -hmm. there's edge cases, but that's generally the price points. Yeah. And so where does the, the equity come into play? So I would just defer equity, right? Like some of these companies like ClickUp and Kanji, like we, we build millions with, sure. right? We placed a, a ton of people there. And so it's like, all right, let's, you know, defer 50 or a hundred thousand dollars towards equity at whatever your last valuation was. I want to be on the cap table. I want to have a little skin in the game. 
that way we can all align incentives and we can celebrate together when we're on the on the uh, podium yeah so i think um yeah that's that's the model in a nutshell okay yeah and um and and so at this point you basically have people coming to you besides just your vc partnerships you probably have founders just coming to you and said hey come on let's go <laughs> i think the i think the mission of any business should be to create raving fans yeah and when you create enough raving fans you have an inbound of opportunities that come your way naturally mm -hmm. if you crush it for people they are going to tell their friends about it right. so a raving fan to me means two things number one is they refer business and number two is they leave us testimonials so we have sales and we have marketing fodder um, from each of those raving fans. And if someone really receives the results and the experience they were expecting or it's better, they're going to word of mouth help you grow your business. Yeah. And that's the most powerful thing is people think brand is your content. Brand is, is your reputation from your service or your product. It's the quality of your service or product is your brand. Marketing just magnifies it. But when your service is so exceptional that you blow people's socks off, they are going to tell more people. And yeah. so that's been the growth engine of our business is killing it for founders. They introduce us to more founders, more venture capital firms. It's just this beautiful flywheel ecosystem, but it's all predicated on five-star results yeah. every time. You know, And I think if you can do that, that your customer problem will solve itself. Like your customers are your best salespeople. Yeah. Right, they should, be, they should be spreading the word. Yeah, They're the most credible. So yeah, venture capitalists and founders are our entire lead gen system. And it's all, you know, most of it's inbound at this point. You gotta still go out there and build relationships, but I would say we have more than we can handle just coming inbound now. Yeah, yeah. And so what's the kind of next step? I know you wanna get to nine figures with yes. under 100 employees. That's, yes. that's the- 100 million in revenue, 100 people, and I want a thousand raving fans. So I want a thousand founders out there yeah. shouting from the rooftop that we were the game changing partner to help them achieve their visions. Yeah. And so that's the mission. Yeah. But to do that, the talent density required to do that is exceptionally hard. Right. Because right? you need to find the best people in the world. Mm -hmm. And I've interviewed 340 people now to hire 20. Um, <laughs> and they're really, really hard to find. It's hard to find exceptional people. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's the goal now is. To get to 100 million in revenue, we have to create much more value, mm -hmm. right? We need to bring on about 1,000 companies a year. Wow. Right, right now we're maybe, maybe, maybe 800. Right now we're bringing on about 200 a year. Yeah. Um, but as that scales, it's more challenging. So you have to get better. Like the, the, the main things is number one is I, I do a lot of the sales for the company. Eventually that won't be the case. Yeah. As a CEO, you have to constantly try to make yourself obsolete. Yeah. And hire better people. Fire yourself. Yeah. Fire yourself as often as possible. That's going to be the height of your success. Sure. So it's a lot of that. It's about hiring great people. But then I think the hard part people don't think enough about when you're scaling, it's just about leadership. Mm -hmm. It's about people. I've proved that I can go out and find the best people and build the team. But the hard part is developing them. The hard part is leading and creating layers of leadership where you're maximizing the potential of each person in your company. And you know, you, you have a strong culture because I know a lot of companies that scale, the culture doesn't scale with it. It starts breaking and crumbling. Yeah. You have cracks and the bigger the cracks are at the foundation, as you scale, they get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And if you don't address those, your company starts falling apart. And I see that all the time with competitors. So what I'm focused on now outside of client acquisition and just doing the best we can do on delivery, which is always the core focus, it's always keeping the customer in mind and saying, how do we create the best service and results for this customer, it's it's leadership. It's how do we cultivate and develop the people on the team yeah. and maximize their potential so they stay and three, four years from now, they're three, four times as productive. Yeah. So that's the challenging part now. And what do you look for for internal employees? We have uh, a number of core values. So first core value, we have Mamba mentality. I want people with Mamba mentalities, with an obsession for being the best in the world at their mm -hmm. craft are constantly learning, looking for an edge. I want those obsessive people. So their job isn't a job, it's a craft. Mm -hmm. I want people who put the team first. I want people who are ambitious, but they understand to accomplish what we want to accomplish. It takes collective greatness and they work well with the team. Mm -hmm. I want raw IQ, great pattern recognition skills, great ability to adapt, pivot, and learn. Mm -hmm. 
they have a high rate of self growth because a lot of people come in, they can't grow fast enough. They just have limited mindsets or they don't have a voracious appetite to grow. And those people tend to get lapped. Yeah. Uh, those are extremely important qualities to me. I want people with chips on their shoulders, mm -hmm. something to prove to the world or to themselves where they have to be successful. It's not a nice to have. This is everything to them. Yeah. That's really important to me. I want kind, honest, high integrity people. Yeah. Right. People that I can implicitly trust to do the right thing, even when I'm not looking, because when you scale companies, you have no purview into 95% of what's happening. So I want good, kind hearted people that are heart centered, that I know will take care of our clients that'll operate with integrity, that'll treat each other well. Um, so we can maintain an amazing company culture. Yeah. Um, those are, I would say the main things I look for. I think you also got to find people that are fun that yeah. you want to hang out with, you know, sure. like, cause it's hard to like really pour into somebody if you don't really like them. Yeah. Right. And if you're going to work in a team and have this high camaraderie, you got to love the people you're with. And so I think that's important. I would take someone who's an eight out of 10 talent and 10 out of 10 trust and loyalty mm -hmm. and commitment versus the inverse. Because I think if you have really talented people and you find them, but they don't have loyalty, they're only in it for themselves, they, they don't have the other skill sets, eventually they're gonna dilute your culture or they're just gonna leave anyway. And so I, I like to find people that have a lot of talent, that have high integrity, they have a lot of ambition in, the, in work ethic. I forgot about work ethic, work ethic I think. That kind of goes into mama mentality, sure. but... Um, those people, and then I can, I can, if they're an eight, I can cultivate them into a 12. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I can pour into them and, and I like them and I trust them. And so, you know, I think that's key, but it, it's really everything, man. Cause I, I, there's no such thing as a self-made millionaire or a self-made entrepreneur. Right. The bigger the dream, the more important the team. Mm -hmm. So the, the ceiling to your success is the caliber of the team that you can build. And that's what I realized is I've started scaling more and more. I realize how less important I am because it, it, it's the team delivering 98% of the results. And so it really just is about the team. And so like it humbles you because yeah. when you're an all-star yourself, you're like, yeah, I'm the man, but I don't think that anymore. I don't think I, I, I'm not Kobe. I wanted to be Kobe before, but now I want to be Phil. Yeah. Right. I want to be the guy on the court coaching and helping people ascend into their greatness you know, and that's more of my motive now. So at some point, I think you got to make that switch. Yeah. And what are some kind of best practices that, or do you just kind of let them, let them cook on their own? I mean, are, are you, you know, obviously LinkedIn for anyone in our space is, is key. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, do you kind of, you just let them kind of do their thing? Do you kind of direct them like, hey, this is how we do it? Well, I think the people on our team are super smart. So you know, like, I think when you hire really smart, ambitious people, you don't have to like tell them everything, but you need to just, a CEO has to give clear vision and direction. Mm -hmm. And we, it's a collaborative process of figuring out, hey, what's the best way to achieve these outcomes together? Um, so I provide strategy and direction uh, where we should go. Um, but then you, when you're a startup, you need people that can problem solve themselves and can yeah. figure out stuff themselves and can self-manage. So that's our team, I mean, they're just, they're just really talented people. They don't need a lot of direction. They might need coaching on this or how do you close this person or, you know, how do you talk through equity versus RSUs or like, hey, what are your best practices for structuring your calendar so you can maximize your time? So we're all learning from each other at all times. It's just mm -hmm. a constant knowledge share. Um, but yeah, I do think you, you have to provide frameworks. You have to provide general metrics. You have to provide some direction because not everyone operates with com a complete lack of direction and structure. Sure. That's usually just the first few people in the company and you do need structure to scale. It's mm. really important. So yeah, we have guidelines and frameworks and guardrails um, and a clear North Star. But at the same time, yeah, everyone kind of knows what we got to do. It's not too complex. Sure. We got to bring in great clients. We've got to deliver better than anyone else in the world and achieve the outcomes they're looking for and give them a great experience. And it's yeah. like everything comes back to how do we do that better? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so a, a couple things I want to know, do you guys do any, uh, contracting? No. Okay. So it's all I, perm place. I hate contract recruiting. Yeah. Um, I used to do it and obviously it's super lucrative. I just hate it. Yeah. Um, I just hate the transactional nature of it. Sure. And it's, 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 it's exhausting. 
Um, again, but I, if you're doing a contract shop, you should work with big companies because they have way bigger contracts. But like, sure. I don't like working with massive companies. I like working with companies that are earlier, yeah. that are startups that like have a big dream. They don't know how to execute it. They need an elite team. They don't know how to build that team fully. And I'm like, I can come in and add serious value. Like that's what I really get inspired by. Yeah. And as far as an eventual exit for you, I think a lot of executive search firms have the issue where you have some, you have the contracts to, uh, you know, place the FTE people. Yeah. But without the recurring revenue, sometimes mm -hmm. it's like, what is the value? You know, so yeah. you're basically putting in proprietary processes and, and things in place for the eventual, I mean, I assume that an eventual exit is. is what it's on the for. table. It's on the table. Okay. It's going to be a while. I mean, we have to get to 100 million in revenue before I consider doing anything. It's sure. just a milestone I've committed to for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you can still get five, six, uh, uh, five, six X multiples on your EBITDA. Yeah. For non recurring. Recurring is going to increase your multiple. But sure. I don't care about having a higher multiple playing in a space that I have no passion for that I'll probably get smoked on and hate my life in anyway. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you can build technology into your product as well into your service to automate things get like one of a company in our space that's also direct hire sold at a 13x multiple wow um so you can get good multiples in the space but again it's there's a lot of factors that go into that but i'm not so concerned about the exit right now we're building a company that could be exited but my 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 thesis is build a company that you could sell but build it so great that you don't want to sell it and if you want to have some sort of liquidity event at some point, whether it's selling the whole company or selling a minority stake just to take some liquidity off the table and maybe have a strategic relationship, that's on the table. I think you've got to think about that stuff. But um, I just want to build the most remarkable company, create a lot of enterprise value, make sure we have a sustainable growing organism that can operate at exponential levels without me, mm -hmm. which is the hardest part for any CEO <laughs> to actually get to. I think that's the hallmark of a world-class entrepreneur. Um, which I'm aspiring to be. And yeah, it's, but yeah, you I think you could, you could build with the end in mind, like, but I'm not like, oh, I gotta get here and sell my company at this exact date. Like a future outcome is possible for sure. Uh, but I think the main thing is I just wanna have as much fun as I can building the best company. Sure. And it's like, you don't raise your kid thinking, oh, I can't wait to get rid of this thing at 18. <laughs> you know, so it's the same yeah, thing with a company to me. The like <laughs> there's probably a process where you part at some point, but I just wanna focus on developing this child, yeah. um, this amazing company into all it can be. And so my focus is more on, on that. Yeah. And, um, one thing I, I definitely wanted to ask you about, uh, obviously we moved here about the same time. Yeah. Everyone you would meet at the bars was a security token. I have a security token company, blah, you know, NFT guys. Sure. Um, that didn't go the way some of those people thought, uh, maybe NFTs will come back, you know, but what do you see as far as the industry? Mm -hmm. um, things you we hear about a lot that are going to take off, obviously AI, but kind of what in AI? What do you think people should target from an industry perspective? Okay, so there's a lot of industries that are great. So I think, again, self-awareness. you got to pick an industry that is directionally correct. Sure. Like there's an actual future in that industry. Um, like if you're currently in law school, there's going to be AI that replaces you in about two years. Mm -hmm. I don't know how viable that is. Um, but I think there's crypto, there's traditional SaaS, there's AI, there's so many exciting spaces. If there's yeah. a good business to be had, there's a great opportunity there. Uh, I focus a lot in AI now. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's a freaking buzzword, but like AI is the most disruptive technology we've ever seen and probably will ever see in our lifetime. Yep. There's a lot, different areas of AI. There's like core models right? Like an open AI, chat GPT. Um, there's infrastructure companies building horizontal platforms and there's actual applications. Uh, I think there's places to win in all of them. I like the vertical application space because okay. there's so many industries that have not been introduced to AI models yeah. that if you apply even the current existing AI models to their space, they can completely disrupt it. So mm -hmm. you have a ton of data and in insurance and you have a traditional insurance company, well, apply ChatGPT and do LLMs. Now you can completely disrupt your industry in that vertical space. Yeah. Uh, because again, you have a competitive edge in insurance. You're just applying modern technology to better serve your customers, to automate, to reduce redundancies, um, to reduce headcount, um, to reduce friction. And so vertical 
AI SaaS is a really fun place for me to play because I'm working with companies that are disrupting the legal industry, the insurance industry, sure. uh, the construction industry, mm-hmm. and it's super exciting. And I think it's less competitive than some of these core models because like it's going to be a handful of core models that win, yeah. but there's an infinite amount of consumer companies or uh, application companies that can win. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. Um, let me uh, let me pivot to some personal development stuff because um, I, I know you've spent six multiple six figures on personal development yeah. stuff. Why don't you uh, just kind of help people that are you know starting out or looking to invest in personal development? Things to look out for, mistakes you uh, kind of want to warn people about. Uh, you said I guess half of it was a waste. Uh, there was some total nonsense. Uh, but obviously, a lot was very beneficial, and the stuff that paid off was... Look, yeah. personal development is the single most important thing in the world. Mm-hmm. It's People are reading business books, but they have broken mindsets. Sure. What are you going to do with that information if you have a limiting belief that you're not aware of that's dictating all your results in your life? Right. What if you can't have hard conversations because you're afraid of feeling certain emotions that you've repressed? Mm-hmm. You're not going to be an effective human being. You know, it, it, Business books and tactics and strategies are great, but... You have to master yourself before you master the world. And focusing inward, investing in yourself, your skill sets, your habits, your mindset, your belief systems, your emotions, all these things, just mastering yourself as a human being is the exact path to having everything you want in life. Yeah. Right? And so I've done a ton of personal development. I've read hundreds and hundreds of books on various topics like spirituality, mindset, Uh, how the brain works, quantum physics, business leadership. I think the main thing is people are like, what book should I read or what event should I go to? All of them, right? right? Like people are like, oh, I just, I need to wait for the perfect recommendation to read a book. And I'm like, if someone recommends a book, I'm going to read it tomorrow, right? Right? It's like one of those things where it's like, you need to have a habit an operating system of being a voracious learner. Mm -hmm. Being a voracious learner is the number one skill set to people that have incredible lives. Yeah. Because there's nothing they cannot do. And they're not stuck in their past. They're able to create any future they want because they're willing to revisit their belief systems and their thinking patterns and upgrade their skill sets to meet the destiny that they want to create. And so for me, it's reading books, it's going to events, it's doing masterminds where you're paying to be in groups of people that are more successful than you. It is doing therapy, it's doing psychedelics, whatever you're into, but it's just the practice of getting new information, reflecting on yourself and figuring out how can I be better? Yeah. How can I heal? Which is a big part of the journey. Sure. And I think a lot of these things are key. And I'll give one example to show people the power of personal development. Mm. Right? I, did a, uh, um, I did a seminar called Landmark Forum six years ago. Just, yeah, six years ago. I was 27 years old. And I'm in this seminar and we're, we're examining how we became who we are and we're trying to find blind spots. Mm-hmm. And blind spots are these things that you can't see them, but they're the invisible barrier to your life. They're stopping you in life, but you don't know why. Yeah. Because you can't identify them. I was okay. 12 years old, I found in this moment at a baseball game and we're play, in a playoff game. It's the ninth inning, bottom of the ninth, two outs. I'm on second base, there's a pop fly. I run, I round third, I go to slide at home plate. I slide, I get tagged out, we lose the game. And my team threw their hats and their mitts on the ground and they isolated me, right? Uh, Completely, they're like, all right, this was your fault. Like you lost the game. And I I became completely extradited. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, what happened is a 12 year old lost a baseball game. Yeah. But the story I created in my mind at that moment was if you put me in a position to lead, I will let everyone down. And I was like, the second thing I said was, screw everybody, I don't need you, right? So those stories carried with me from 12 to 27. Mm. I was living inside of a 12 year old's belief system and I quit all team sports from that moment. (laughs) And then I also had to overcompensate for everything. I had to be the best at everything as the solo guy to prove I was worthy and good enough. Yeah. And I had an intention, this desire to be this leader and build companies and change the world. And I've had that since I was young. I had this deep desire for more to be a really impactful human on this planet. But I kept sabotaging everything because I had to prove I was better. I was deeply insecure and subconsciously, I was like, oh shit, I am going to let everyone down. So I was sabotaging every opportunity to be a leader I could find. 
because I was so afraid of that and that unconscious fear was driving me. Well, as soon as I discovered that in that seminar, I said, well, let me create a new possibility for my life then. I cr I'm creating the possibility that I am a leader, that I can do big things because now I know that that belief is false because I've spotted it. I've taken the blind spot, I put it into my awareness and I went in just from that moment on. I said, you know what, I'm gonna go build a school. Decided to go build a team. A couple months later, I was out in Africa. We built our first school in Malawi um, and then turned that into a nonprofit, built many more schools. I got promoted at my last company that I was at, became uh, a director there, and I was like actually managing and leading people. And then that was the precursor that gave me the confidence to go start my own company because I yeah. no longer was going to live inside the belief that I was going to let everyone down, that I couldn't be a leader yeah. based off a of past experience that I was living in as the current truth. And so that's one of a thousand examples I have is you have to work on your own mind. Yeah. You have to get aware of why you think the way you think, what do you believe, and is the way that I'm thinking, behaving, and feeling congruent with the future I wanna create? If not, let me learn from everybody in life. Let me be a constant sponge and go to, you know, get proximity to people that are where I wanna be. Let me find out how to become the person capable of creating that life. Yeah. And so I always say it takes a lot longer to become a millionaire than to make a million dollars. Yeah. To be, create the person that became a millionaire, it took me four years of personal growth intensely before I even started my company. But then as soon as I started my company, I was a multimillionaire within 18 months right. because of the work I had done prior. And so I think working on yourself is the prerequisite to any greatness. Mm. And that, that was the thing I discovered, man. Like you can give someone a billion tactics, you can give them the blueprint to making X amount of money, but if they don't have the right mindset, the right habits, and they're not that person capable of achieving it, they're not gonna act on the information. Yeah, yeah, wow. <laughs> um, okay, so that's something to look at. Uh, just invest in yourself, right? Invest in yourself first and then obtain them. Uh, I heard you say this invest in yourself, you know, get to a certain level and then invest in whatever, real estate, crypto. Look, if you've got a hundred grand right now, don't put it in crypto or the stock market. You're, it's not enough money to do anything substantial with your life. Yeah. Invest that back into you. I was making 300 grand five, six years ago and I would pay half that to the government and I had 150 grand left over. I would pay my rent and my bills and I put $100,000 back to back years. So 66% of my take home income um, back into me, yeah. back into coaching. I took 20 different courses online. I read every freaking book I could find. I paid for one-on-one -on -one coaching. I would see someone epic on the internet, reach out to them. Can I do a one-on-one -on -one with you? Mm -hmm. You know, just constantly learning from whoever was the source of what I wanted to learn. If it was yeah. a relationship coach, someone had a great relationship, I wanted to pay them to learn from them in relationships. If it was a fitness coach, awesome. I want to figure out how to look like that, how to feel like that. If someone had done that in business, I'm like, cool. I wanna, I wanna figure out that, I'll pay to get in these rooms. I was, you know, I had probably 20 grand in my name and I spent $15,000 on a, on a mastermind, wow. right? But I knew that if I didn't get in proximity of people that had what I wanted, that I would never understand how to get there. Yeah. And when you're in proximity of rooms of people that are who you wanna be, it changes your identity, yeah. right? You need to focus on your identity. Like you're never gonna achieve more in life than you think you deserve. And people always talk about your network is your net worth. Mm -hmm. I think it's your net worth times your self worth or your, 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 your network okay. times your self worth is your net worth. Yeah. Because you can have a great network around you, but if you don't have the self worth, you're not going to be able to build relationships with those people. Yeah. Cause you're going to perceive that they're above you and there's going to be some weird energetic dissonance and you're going to repel the people in your life that you want to attract. Yeah. And so you need to work on your self worth and building a character that you admire and Make sure all your emotions, your thoughts, your actions are aligned to the future you want to create. Then get in the right rooms. Be focused on developing yourself, learning from people. Get in the right rooms with people that are where you want to be. And all of a sudden, your whole operating system changes. You start perceiving yourself differently. You start yeah. seeing new possibilities. Even me, like a lot of my friends are worth hundreds of millions, in some case billions. That forces me to think differently. Yeah. If I wasn't in proximity of that level of frequency and that level of conversation and these guys telling me, yo, you need to think bigger. Like you could do this, this and that. I, I would just be sitting here as my most successful friend right. thinking I had made it already. When in fact, if you just keep putting yourself in bigger ponds where you're the smallest fish, 
that is the best thing you can do to force your growth, especially if you see yourself as a peer to them and they're your actual friends. Yeah. Because you never want to be the lowest guy on the totem pole in your peer group. Right. So that peer accountability and pressure can be very positive for you to accelerate you, to get you thinking bigger. And so you got to get around better information. I mean, when I, when I left uh, five years ago, man, I, all my friends, we were just going to clubs. We we're drinking 24 seven. Yeah. Just doing nothing but partying. You know, it was a, a bad atmosphere. So I had to let go of all my friends. Mm -hmm. It was a lonely period because there's a lonely period when you're getting, you're, you're exiting from your other friend group. You haven't really become the person you need to be yet to attract the new people in your life that you want to be around. And it's lonely and figuring it out. D dead mentors are my best friends. Sure. I would read a bunch of ancient people, Benjamin Franklin, Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. I would read, I would get inspiration from these guys, virtual mentors, the Tony Robbins, Joe Dispenza. I was filling myself with high quality information, just programming myself to be who I needed to be and then taking new actions so I could attract those people. Yeah. But um, I think back to what we're talking about is like, yeah, you want to network, you need to have proximity to great people. Um, but that means you got to work on yourself and, and be the person that deserves to be there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that is what I would say. If you're, if you want to 10 X your life, you've got to change your environment yeah. and your environment is the people that you talk to. It's the conversations you engage in. It's your physical spaces that you occupy. You shouldn't be at clubs better to be at a library yep. or be at a mastermind event. And it's really anything in your environment that, mm -hmm. uh, that you're looking at. So you got to upgrade your associations. Yeah. Right. Your associations. You got to make sure that everything in your life is congruent with what you want to create for yourself. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a freaking billionaire, go hang out with billionaires and see how they think and say, hey, well, how do they see this differently than me? And can I just adopt their belief system? Because clearly I'm not thinking about this with the right mental model. Yeah. And so you're constantly upgrading your own mental models and uh, looking in the mirror and saying, if I don't have this, there's something within me that is incorrect. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, how can I be aware of that face off with myself in the mirror and keep improving myself to become who I want to be, to live the life I want to live. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go, I have to ask you about this. Um, obviously you've obtained uh, great monetary success. You've also maintained your fitness levels. So I need to give some tips and I want to hear a day in the life, how you're able, because obviously you're a busy guy. Too. Yep. <laughs> Extremely busy guy. So, how have you been able to maintain your fitness while still, you know, keeping that upward trajectory of success? Speaking of health and fitness, what are you doing for your vitamins? Taking one of those CVS multivitamins, is that giving you too high of levels in some things, too low of levels? You probably don't know. That's why you need Bionic. They give personalized recommendations for vitamins sent directly to you after their blood tests. Use my code jobber for a discount on both of their plans. I don't look at it as I'm maintaining my fitness. I look at health as the foundation of everything. Mm -hmm. So the question is how am I maintaining my business, right? But the fitness is first. Sure. Um, if you don't have health, you don't have anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if you want to be at the peak of your industry, you have to be an athlete. Yeah. I need maximum energy, maximum power, uh, maximum stamina. And I don't want to be completely overweight with tons of money in my bank and I, I, it's hard to get out of bed in the morning. My, my joints hurt. That's not a successful life to me. Yeah. Right. So money is an amplifier. So I don't put that first. I put health first. So I work out every day at 1 PM. Mm -hmm. so I do it six days a week. I do intense training. Yeah. Um, I, so I, from one to 2 PM, I have a trainer and I do intense, uh, like weightlifting. And then mm -hmm. I play pickleball and some sports okay. for some good cardio. And then other than that, yeah, I have a good training rec uh, regimen. I've been doing that for 15 years. Um, and then I, I think the rest is diet, man. Like you got to figure out macronutrients, like fats, carbs, and protein. You got to just understand base level macronutrients. So you know what you're putting in your body. I had a coach, uh, I'll end on this. I had a coach and he, he really changed the way I see fitness and diet and everything really is a spiritual lens. Mm -hmm. If you want to do, look, if, if you want to win in life, you have to control the controllables. Right. Yeah. I'm okay taking an L if I just lost, but I'm not okay taking an L if it was something in my control. Yeah. Right. And so when you look at fitness, when you look at your diet, these are all intentions you put out into the world mm -hmm. saying, Hey, I'm going to eat this exact calorie intake and these macronutrients. I'm going to do this fitness regimen at this time every day. Mm -hmm. It's opportunities for you to keep your word to yourself, to build your power. 
And so I, you know, I was on this exact macro plan with a coach and I went out to dinner with a friend. He ordered some French fries. I ate a French fry and I called my coach and I was like, Hey, I, I messed up. I ate a French fry. He's like, so you're telling me this guy, Chris, who wants to go change the world with all these big dreams, walks into a room and he's supposed to command the room and influence the room gets influenced by a French fry. Wow. Like he's, he sold his dreams and his integrity for a fucking fry. And so it seems kind of crazy to most people, but when you're operating at the highest level and you want to go change the world, right. like you have to be so radically in alignment with what you say you're going to do. And every time you're exact and you actually measure things in your life, instead of just, ah, yeah, I want to hit like a couple million this year in revenue. No, I want to hit $25 million this year in revenue. Yeah. Exactly. Now you're on the fucking hook. And so if you can do that in more places of your life and put yourself on the hook more and actually follow through, that will build on canny levels of confidence yeah. and power. And so that's how I see fitness in life is fitness is my foundation, my diet, my fitness, my regimens, my programs. Um, I just take a lot of pride in them because when I execute them effectively and I honor my word, I'm more powerful when I can execute everywhere else in life. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, when you're doing business, if you were kind of sloppy, it kind of shows a lack of discipline. And Absolutely. Like, what else is this Dude, guy? People are undisciplined, undisciplined in right. life, right? Discipline, people lack discipline. If you can out discipline people, you're going to crush them, yeah. right? I worked from 5 a.m. till 10 p.m. every day for the first two years. I might have taken off 10, 12 days over two years. Just disgusting work ethic. I wouldn't recommend that for a long period of time. It's really hard to maintain for your health. And I neglected my health then and I paid for it, sure. um, which is why I had to adapt. But if you can out discipline people, right? In the morning, I got four hours of deep work. I'm focusing on my most mission critical task. I'm gonna crush that. Then I'm gonna take calls from 11 to one. From then I'm gonna hit my gym session from 2.30 until 7.30. I'm gonna rip calls that are focused on my highest priorities, developing my team, bringing in new clients. And then at 7.30, I'm gonna chill, unwind, be in bed by 10, back up by six. Yeah. Like if you can follow that program, you can out execute everybody. Yeah, yeah. So you're up at 6 a.m. every day and that's when it begins. Yep. Okay. Wow. Wow. Well, this was amazing. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, again, I, I was looking forward to meeting you and, you know, ended up getting an hour of uh, asking you questions. Hope you guys got a lot of great takeaways as far as startups, as far as industries to target. And uh, Chris, thanks again, man. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. We'll see you guys next time.